Hello friends, Jerry Rosa here at the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. We've got another classic Gibson mandolin in the shop today. This one is a little bit different uh, than your average because it's a conversion model, if you will. This used to be an F12 mandolin that is basically converted to an F5. There's a bunch of differences that I am not fully aware of, so I'm not going to try to act like an expert because I'm not. Um, but I'm not sure this peg head uh, overlay is original to it. Most F12s that I saw on Google by Googling uh, either had a plain peg head or something totally different than this black. You know, they, most of those weren't bound with any binding. So somebody's done a lot of work here. Um, this fretboard would have been squared off across here on an F12, I believe. This one has the extension and all that. So it's been monkeyed with is all I can tell you for sure. The uh, serial number in this F12, and it does say F12 in there, it says the serial number is 21694. I'm looking here, I get it turned where I can see the light. 21694 is the serial number. Uh, the customer told me the vintage on it I don't remember, but I'm thinking this one was from the 60s, 70s, I can't remember. It just looks like it would be 60s, 70s to me. He sent it along for a, a setup, but he's also got a very long list of things that this he wants me to look at. And it's a long list. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's just talk about some of them here as we look at the mandolin. Okay, uh, I'm afraid it needs a lot of little things, he says. First, of course, it needs a general setup. The nut is very low. It doesn't buzz, but with light gauge strings, he said. But he wants me to set it up for medium. And he says he thinks it'll need a new nut. Well, it may. I, you know, I can't speak to that yet. Um, the bridge is rather high. He says this one has the problem, you know, where the neck angle is too low, which a lot of the Gibsons of this era did. And uh, that's true. He, he, he was the one with the F4 mandolin that I worked on, and uh, it also had a very low neck angle. You know, he may, you know, we'll have to work on the bridge or the saddle or both. Some refretting may be required, he said. Uh, the frets are, have been filed, you can tell, extensively, and they're pretty flat. Uh, I can't say for sure without taking it apart and looking at it closer whether we can recrown that or not. We'll, um, let's see. Binding appears to be very brittle, and there's at least three breaks or separations requiring filing, the worst of which is the intermediate point on the fingerboard extension. And I guess he's talking about this part right here. It's a, the, uh, there's a big gap in there you can probably see, and uh, it's, you know, it's pulled away from the tight curl up in here. So that's going to take some work to fix that, if we can fix it. The, uh, this binding has probably been added uh, when they did the, the new fretboard or whatever, and it doesn't match up tight to the nut here. Uh, these, these dots are high, are proud. Uh, there is a gap between the uh, neck and the fingerboard, which you would expect if they've replaced it. Well, the phone rang and interrupted me, so I'm sorry. I don't know where I left off exactly, but I was talking about, I think, this binding, and there's bumps on this. The uh, binding doesn't match up good right here. There's, you know, problem with the binding here. There's been a little patch of binding put in here um, that maybe you can see. And when they put that in there, they must have clamped across here, and the clamps created indentions in this side and made a mess. And so there's a lot of issues with the binding there. Then there's places on the binding around here where it's, it's actually coming loose in these tight curls. I'm not even sure the customer noticed that, but like you can stick, I can stick the corner of this paper down in there. Um, you know, so there's places all over that have issues with binding. Um, I saw another break in it here. There's a break right here in the binding. Um, it looks like there's been two cracks right there that are older maybe. Uh, there's just a lot of binding issues. There's, there's a crack in the binding here, crack in the binding there. So it's cracked up pretty good. He's also pointed out about this spot right here that could be touched up with some dye and right here. Um, he goes on and on and on. There's a bunch of stuff. The truss rod hole, uh, 
is lower than most F5 I've seen and and uh, so you know apparently there's something wrong with the truss rod it's hard to get into it it looks like maybe it looks to me like they've put some weird truss rod cover over it to cover all the hole and everything and then they had to cut out for these tuning keys up here you can see the tuning buttons are completely trashed they're just shrunk up to nothing I don't know why these three must have been replaced or something is what I'm guessing. Uh, you know, it's got these Clusen Deluxe, I think is what these are, tuning keys on the back. I don't know if those are original or not. I would say not, and the reason I would say that is because this one here actually extends out past the little hole here, and I doubt they would have done that from the factory. Um, I don't know. There's just a lot of things, but he, and it, the list is very long. So, you know, there's a ton of work to be done here and I'm not sure he knows how much work and whether he wants to pay for that kind of work or not. You know, if you really try to put it up in tip top shape, I mean, it would take hours uh, and hours of work. The things that bother me the most are the setup. The setup's quite high. Um, you know, maybe a little touch up. But uh, these tuning keys bug the crud out of me. I don't like that at all. I wouldn't want that. And, and I don't, like I said, I don't know if those are original or not. And then, you know, I don't like this either. I'm not sure what's going on there, but that's, it's just a weird strap button. I guess it's okay. You can put it, tighten it down and then it, your strap can't come off, I guess. But there is a lot of work to be done here. I think I'm going to go with the bigger ticket items first and just knock out those and uh, then let him know how much money we've got going on here and then see how much further he wants to go. We'll play it a little bit to show you what it sounds like as it came in the door. By the way, by putting that fretboard extension on, I just noticed this as I was playing, this is almost rubbing the top. Well, let's just say it's, I mean, it's micro, it's a micro millimeter from the top there. Uh, my friends out in millimeter land, do you appreciate the fact that I said micro millimeter? <laughs> anyway, it's just, it's just, it's all but touching the top so that's kind of crazy there too that doesn't look right but that's that low neck angle and uh it's really going to be a difficult one to fix i mean we really do have a nearly flat neck angle on a mandolin which is not a good thing tell the bottom is there but it just seems awfully twingy twangy to me hopefully we can improve the sound of that quite a bit but I'm not sure that we can change the sound much at all really because he the, the guy doesn't really want to do a whole lot to the mandolin in of the things that I would typically do but anyway oh my goodness I don't even really know where to start. <laughs> Let's just get started. Sorry the air conditioner's running. I wish I could find a way around that. But I'm not going to turn it off because it just takes forever for that thing to shut off. You can see here that, as I pointed out, they cut out spots for these tuning keys to go. They put the hole way away from the slot. They could have put the hole right at the end of it there and had a much smaller truss rod cover and then they probably wouldn't have had to cut out anything for these tuners. It's just really a dumb way to do it in my opinion. When they put the peg head overlay on it too they got it off sided you can see it's much closer to this tuner than it is to this one when they cut out this hole again. It just is what it is. I don't know how deep we want to go there. I might make a new one of these fill that hole, shorten this up. I just think that would look better. This to me looks really hokey. I guess I'll start on this binding. My thought is um, 
I'll see if I can do something to soften it up and put it back in place. But my gut tells me probably not. That's not an easy fix right here without doing the whole binding. First thing I'm electing to do is to clean out the, the junk that's in there because they've tried to re-glue it back in place and the glue's built up. The problem with this is I'm afraid I'm going to crack it and break it because I bet this is really brittle. But it can't go back in there with all that glue build up. And it appears to be built up in here too where this can't go in tight. Trying to use the back of the blade as a scraper. A lot of junk has fallen out. If you can look under there you can probably see how much junk has fallen out right in here. So a lot of stuff came out of there. Okay, so it may be a combination. It may be that it shrunk and they never really had enough there to begin with. I'm going to try to get some kind of a heat shield to lay on top of this some way and heat this all up right in here and see if we can't kind of, you know, get it a little more malleable where we can move it around a little bit because it's not going to bend the way it is. There's no question about that. It just break right off. All right, I have some pretty thick cardboard on here. This is thicker than what you would find on the back of a writing tablet, so it's it's pretty it's pretty good for insulation against the top. I've got the heating gun actually on fairly low, um, but it's hot enough where it'll start to get you know it'll burn you probably if you kept your hand right there for a while. But uh, it's 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 pretty low really. I mean I can hold it there for a while. And now it's starting to get pretty hot. So I'm just going to kind of use that as my gauge on this plastic, you know. Starting to get pretty hot probably about right now. I'm just going to soften that up if I can. We'll test that right there and see what that's done, if anything. Yeah, that's helped it some. Oh yeah, well, yeah, I was able to pull it right over there. Look at that. Look at that. That's amazing. I never thought it would go that far, but it pulled that far, so that's pretty good. Yeah. Actually, that's almost good enough. It's a little bit tight still, really. I'm going to see what I can do about the other side here. Heat it up a little bit more. See what I can do about this side and uh, that pushed that in there pretty good and I'm trying to what would really be nice is if I if this was flexible enough where I could get to this and round this corner off some more on this wood I could push it over a little bit better but that's quite a bit better than it was I mean I, that's really acceptable right there if I can get it to glue in place and stay there. Now that's the tricky part. I think because of the kind of problem we've got here, I think I'm going to use CA glue on this. Um, I don't like to use CA glue so much on binding, but it's, it's pretty good. It'll hold it. It takes less clamping and stuff, and we've got clamping issues here, really. We, we really need to just get it where we need it and get it to stick. So... That's what we're going to try. I took the cardboard out and replaced it with two layers of the shop towel here. It just barely could get wiggled under this end here. I had to force it under there, but it did go. And thinking is, if I do drop some glue, hopefully it'll be on this. And if I have to, I can jerk this out of there and it won't do anything to the top. I'm going to get the accelerator handy. I may have to use that too because I really don't want to have to sit here and hold this for 20 minutes. I, I really don't like using these applicator, these bottles, even though that's got a pretty thin nozzle on it. I think I'm going to go with the uh, pipette deal. I can control that better in my opinion. Okay, I've got the pipette filled with glue. We're going to put it on here and run it quite a ways back here because it was loose quite a ways. And that you can see it sucked in there pretty darn good. We're going to put the pressure on it with this now. I would like to be able to put pressure sideways and in ways both and that's what I think I've got there. And now I'm going to spritz it with this. 
once again by waiting on spritzing it it doesn't turn white generally speaking if you spritz it right away it turns white applying this the accelerator first is a good option sometimes but for me it always sticks too fast then and I don't get it lined up properly so it just it really depends on this situation and in this situation this seemed like the best way to go about it I think we're we're fine now that piece is locked in it's not going to go anywhere this piece on the other hand is not locked in I'm tempted to heat it one more time I think that might be a good idea. This is probably a good enough heat sink, but I can lay this under there just in case. So I've got the wood, I've got the cardboard under there also. That seems pretty good. All right, let's put the glue to it and see what happens. By wiggling it around like that, that will make that glue get down in there really good it appears to have already been set up probably because of the other accelerator spritz it just a little bit to make sure I believe we're pretty darn good there could even possibly use just a tiny bit of light filing right here on this corner to blend the corners together but it's not going to do much. That looks real good compared to what I was actually expecting, so I think we're in good shape. And here's a close-up of what that looks like now compared to what it did look like. So it's, you know, it's pretty good, really. It's not too bad. Better than I thought we would get on that. Okay, up here, this piece has been put in there and it wasn't done real well. It's not tight. Um, when they clamped it, apparently they dented this side. This side's not real tight over to the nut either. Um, I don't know what to do about that, if anything. I will say that these dots are fairly easy to fix. They're sticking up proud. And I've got a real fine jeweler's file here. And we can just kind of go over them and... And I'm, I've got it tilted so it's not getting down on the neck. You, you really don't feel the dots anymore, but the finish is kind of broken up through there too. And you can, so it doesn't feel perfectly smooth, but I'm pretty sure that's all the finish that you're feeling there now. So I'm just going to lightly go over that and maybe smooth that out a little bit so that, you know, there's less bumpity bump 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 going down through there where the finish is chipped off yeah that feels smoother it's not not perfect but it's a lot better than it felt before so and it doesn't change the looks much at all yeah that's a lot better okay so we got some of the issues already knocked off of his list i tell you what these tuner buttons bug me to death i don't know what to do about that it they're little bitty tiny things. They work, but they're not very pleasant to use. You can be opening up a huge can of worms with this. I mean, enormous can of worms uh, by, you know, taking these buttons off. You know, can you get new ones that are going to fit? I don't know. Can you get them all that look alike? You know, I doubt we can match these three. I, I, well, let's just say there's no way I can match those three. So we'd have to replace them all. I think it's very curious that this one here extends into the slot there, which is, I think, very strange. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to give all that stuff some thought while I'm working on the rest of it. So for the next section, I'm going to just do a reef. Uh, a fret leveling first and a recrowning to see if that's going to work. If it's not going to work, then we'll replace all the frets. I'm not going to film that because I've filmed it so many times. I was able to level and recrown these frets and they're now nice and smooth. Uh, you know, if I'm being perfectly honest, there's a little bit of a string groove left. The deepest one is still slightly there, but it's not enough to make it play bad. It'll play fine and to me that was the best way to go to save some time and money. 
And this customer brought me, well, he's already brought me a couple of other instruments in the past, and he brought me three more. So I'm trying to work them in between all the other waiting list customers that I have. I typically don't make walk-ins wait. Um, I typically try to get them worked in. But then again, with bringing me this many instruments, I'm working them in and around the waiting list. What I'm doing now is I'm trying to make a better truss rod cover. This thing here is so hokey with the cutouts here. I, I'm marking what exists presently and I'm going to redo this uh, to bring the hole in closer. So I need to do some measuring there. You know, I could bring the hole in, you know, quite a ways. I could bring it in about here. So I could I could bring this hole in about this much shorter, and I think that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to cut that out in the paper first and see if that covers everything and it works. And we'll make whatever adjustments we have to to make it work. To me, that's just a lot nicer than the mess we've got. Yeah, that looks nice now. So that's what we're going to make. We're going to make that out of plastic and we'll put that in place there. Just looks so much more professional than the other crud. I looked in my plastic and I didn't have much plastic that didn't have a sticky backing on it. This particular piece was an actual guitar truss rod cover. And I thought that I could use it uh, and just cut it down, and that's what I've done here. Gonna just fill that extra little hole there. The customer was concerned about these white spots here and I've got some dark brown dye and they'll just virtually disappear when I put that on here. I will tell you for sure, if this was my mandolin, I would do two things for sure. One would be, I would either go to the very deep expense and depth of resetting the neck, which is hard to do in a mandolin, or I, more likely me, knowing me as I know me, I would probably just put a wedge under it because there's no originality to keep here on this mandolin, in my opinion. I mean, you know, you can talk originality, but it's been modified, homogenized. It's just been changed. So what's the point? I would put a wedge under it so for, for playability and get, the, get this up. I don't think he would even entertain that idea at all. I would also get rid of these frets and scallop it out. I mean, what's the point? You know, it's not an F5, it's never going to be an F5, it's an F12 that sort of looks like an F5. Because of what I was telling you there, now we're going to have to do some significant modification to this bridge and saddle. They've already been significantly modified. <laughs> so, you know, modify them some more is what has to be done. And when I say some more, I mean we really do need to cut quite a bit off in order to get it down. Because when I'm looking at down this fretboard right now, if I'm looking down the fretboard, I'm looking right about here on the saddle. That's about where the fretboard cuts across. And, uh, you know, I mean, it should cut across about in here somewhere. <laughs> so you're talking 200 thousandths of an inch. 
And that's not even doable. That's not even possible. So I'm going to take maybe get 100,000 off of here if I'm lucky. And that's a lot if I get that much. And it's still going to be too high. So for me, I'd put a wedge under it. No question. I wouldn't even think twice about it. You wouldn't even have to ask me twice. As I mentioned, if it were mine, I would put a wedge under here. Well, I thought just before I cut this bridge down again, which once I cut it down again, there's no coming back. I thought I'll call this customer one more time and talk to him about that. And he agreed. Let's do the wedge. Well, you know, I'm not proud of putting wedges under there don't get me wrong but on the other hand you know you got to have some playability and it's just not going to have any if we just cut this way down it's just it's just you're losing it now i also suggested that we scallop that but he's not a fan of that so he did not want to do that but that's okay we at least we're going to do the important thing which is put uh you know make this thing playable because it's it's not playable the way it is really i mean it's just not a good thing at all in an effort to determine how high of a wedge I need, I'm going to be looking down this fretboard, and I'm, you can't see me in the camera, but I'm looking down the fretboard, and I'm trying to decide where does the fretboard intersect the saddle now. And I've got it at the lowest place, and I'm just going to try to put a pencil mark right on that spot. Now I'm going to measure that the best way I can here and I'm just going to round it down because it's almost on an even number and I'm, I'm going to make it less and that uh, that's two hundred thousandths so in order to raise this up to that top of this I am going to raise this by just a hundred thousandths because a hundred thousandths here um, we'll raise it 200 back here so you know we're gonna we're gonna go from nothing to about and i doubt i'll even go a hundred thousands we'll go from nothing to about probably about eighty thousands at the 12th fret here and um that that would be just about the perfect wedge i believe now we'll double check it of course we'll make the wedge and we'll double check it and uh, and and see that but I think that's where we need to be. So we've got her heating up here and I'm going to heat it up pretty darn hot so that we can hopefully not have too much trouble getting the fretboard off. Yep, there you go. Came right off. When got my uh, fretboard template, it's a little bit narrow for this. Um, it's about a binding width narrow, which is about to be expected, I guess you'd say. So what I'll do is I'll use this for a wedge, um, and I'll use a fat pencil and make sure I cut outside the pencil line and we should be good to go. So at about the 12th fret, I want it to be about 80 thousandths thick. So that's just, that's just an approximate. But that'll give me a ballpark to shoot for there. It'll get a little thicker as we go back through here and a little, and obviously much thinner as we go through here. Okay. Yeah, scratching my brain trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. It's, it's a little complicated. You can do a lot of different options. I'm going to put a little scratch mark here at 80 thousandths. This is at the 12th fret. I'm putting a little scratch mark on the side at 80 thousandths. So that's about how thick I want the wedge here at the 12th fret down to nothing and then that's going to make it bigger here so then what I'm going to do is take a ruler lay it on that little scratch mark that'll give you some idea of the size of the wedge we're talking about down to nothing here 
and then that gives me an idea of the thickness here so what I the reason that's important is so I can cut a block and it appears to be about a hundred and sixty thousandths which is weird because that's just isn't that exactly double of the 80 even though that's not halfway down the center of course I made this a little bigger but anyway 160 thousandths right there down to nothing so if I put a hundred and sixty thousandths inch wedge right here and I mean a block right here and start and run this along the saw it'll keep cutting and cutting and cutting till it cuts 160 thousandths off this end so I think that's the way we're going to do it. Let's give it a shot. After cutting this wedge, I wasn't satisfied with it. It was it, it was about right up here, but it was just way too thick back here. And I could tell that instantly. It just didn't work out for some reason. I have been using my little finger plane on it off camera to plane it down. And I'm just going to drag it over this flat table for mica and uh, with this carbon paper. And that will show up the... the extra high spots I still have and they're not very many really they're, I I've been able to keep it pretty flat even though I'm using this finger plane again I, I'm so used to using this finger plane that it's not a problem for me somebody else would want to use a bigger flatter plane but the problem with that is it does tear out and it um, it's hard to hold and and you're just dealing with detail here and you're talking about a very thin piece of wood especially up at this upper end We're about a hundred thousandths right there. Let's see. Let's go to the twelfth fret spot and see where we're at. Originally, I said a hundred thousandths was about right. We were way over that. We were almost double that. We're down to a hundred and five thousandths right at that spot. It's a little bit more than I want. I think I'm just going to first level this out with some sandpaper take a piece of this 220 and just kind of knock the high spots off here the reason for doing that is I want to lay it on here and look down the fretboard again and just to see where we're at in terms of the bridge and it's not a perfect way to do it because you know the fretboard itself is not laying perfectly flat. Well that looks pretty darn good I can tell you already. Laying the bridge on here looking down it now you know it's hard to keep it all flat but we're right at right at the top edge of the bridge right now. Now that would probably be fine because this bridge has been lowered a lot and we can go up with it quite a bit but I don't want to take a chance of getting it too high either so you know I, I would rather you know make sure that we got good adjustment I don't want to get it crazy high either so I'm gonna go ahead and take off some more It's 164,000, so that's a human hair thicker than where I was computing. So that's pretty good. You know, we've got it just about where I want it. And we're only about, at this end, we're 30-some thousandths, but we're going to go thinner there yet because we're going to sand it and we're going to take a little more off with this plane yet. Now you didn't see all that scraping that I just did. I just scraped this smooth on the back. And now the bindings come loose, wouldn't you know? That's always helpful. Anything to make it easier. With the wedge on here, it's got to be pretty darn close. That's going to make, we're going to need a, need a new nut, by the way, because that's going to raise it up just enough to need a new nut. It's hard to hold it in enough places to tell what you got. A fraction below the top of the bridge, so below the top of the saddle I should say it's just below it so I think time we raise this up we'll be okay I don't want to get it too high you know too high is not a great thing either I think by the time we clean all this off
just double checking the taper one more time before I glue it on. It looks real good. When that pulled loose, it actually shrunk more here. It really didn't want to be down there. It's, it's, and I was pulling it, I could feel it trying to stretch as I'm trying to pull it back. And that misaligned these dots with the holes, so now the dots are sticking out again. So, it is what it is, but uh, we'll make it work. We may have to put in a little patch here at the end now because that that binding was under tension going that way and so when it had the opportunity to come loose it came loose and pulled that way about a sixteenth of an inch now from the end there and it won't go that way any further I've tried pulling so it was going to happen eventually anyway probably better it happened here so I could at least put a patch in there while I'm waiting for the glue to set up on that I've got this lined up as good as I can to the wedge and I'm going to try to clean the wedge up some more so that it's not sticking out, especially up here. I'm going to try cleaning up this end especially. Off camera, I spent a lot of time making this uh, fit this whole thing a lot better. It fits it pretty darn accurately. Uh, I wouldn't say it's perfect yet. I'll do the final fit up once I get it glued in place and uh, it's just maybe a hair proud everywhere all the way around so i'm going to go ahead and glue it in place like it is and uh, i'm not going to glue the fretboard on yet i'm just gluing this piece on as far as i can tell that looks like that's going to work really well i wish i had a good way of getting under here and dipping cutting some of that out of there but without creating additional problems i don't see a good way to do that i mean i could I'm sure I could get it done, but I'm afraid I'll scratch the top and cause other issues. So I'm just going to leave well enough alone there. I checked my thing, and I know it's flat. I thought I'd better check this to see how flat this is. And sure enough, there's a little rocking going on right in. It's pivoting, it's pivoting right about here. So there's a little bit of a high spot right in here. Not very high. I mean, we're just talking a few thousands of an inch, I'm, I'm sure. So I'm just going to take this razor blade and work in this area and see if we can blend it out a little bit. The air conditioning's running, but anyway, at least you can see the extreme clamp up there just for that wedge tried to fl keep it flat you know that's the main thing so that's why I put these extra blocks on there and you know try to get as many clamps on there as many places as I could to keep it good and flat in fact I think I'll probably even put another block right here because I just want to make sure it's flat all the way across this wedge has been drying for several hours I have taken the clamps off and now I'm going to try to clean this up to this, especially out over this part. I'm not too worried about this part yet because I'll wait and clean that up when I get the fretboard back on it, I think. Might knock a little bit off this one edge because it's sticking up quite a bit. This side's a little bit proud too, but this one's a little bit too much. So anyway, we're going to clean all this up and uh, try to make it look uh, real good before I put the fretboard on there and that way when we dye this and all this it'll just look like one piece of wood it won't really look like an extra piece in here I went ahead and trimmed up this thing where it really fits everything just perfect I took my straight edge and laid it on here and I can see that we're pivoting at about right in here. So it's a little high right in here and I, I wanna clean that up. We're gonna glue that on there and uh, move on to the next step. 
Well, you know, it just doesn't quit. There was a spot here where the binding just didn't go down tight. And so I cleaned that all out now with my X-Acto knife. I'm going to put some new glue in here. And uh, it seems like it closes up now. I'm going to make sure that the glue gets down in there with the X-Acto knife, pushing it down in there really good. It's coming all the way through, as you can see there. I need to go to lunch anyway, so I'll just let that sit and we'll glue this back when we come back from lunch. I think that's about as good as it gets. We'll just let her sit and uh, move on to the next step. Okay, we'll have to let that set up for an hour or so at least, and then we'll move on from there. There's more loose binding on this thing. I tell you, I think the binding's loose everywhere. This this is loose here, and it's loose, and then I checked it over here, and it's loose over here too. So I'm gonna fix those also while we got it here in the shop. I think I'm going to quit checking because I'm afraid I'll find more. I'm going to go ahead and make a uh, new nut for it while we're waiting. Just thought I'd show you how much that binding shrank up. I did not cut that off. That's the actual amount it shrank up. When it came loose from this side, it just pulled that way instantly. And I tried to stretch it, and that's the farthest I could stretch it. So it actually shrunk more than that. I've got it stretched that way as tight as I can. So I'm going to fill that gap with a piece of old binding here that I think will match real good. Now this has got lacquer on it, that's why it looks a different color. But I think once I clean the lacquer off, put it back on there, I think it's going to be just a real close match. Yeah, it's a very close match. It should be really good. I'm just trying to make sure that the end of this is good and square and clean so that when I put mine on there, it won't look out of place. That's the one advantage of the old glue is that it will melt those plastics and then you can just more or less horse them in there together, leave it a little big and then it'll just melt the ends of them together and you won't hardly see a seam especially if they're the same color and these are I can't tell you these are perfectly the same color there's a little bit of difference but you gotta work with what you gotta work with you can see that little tiny piece I put in between the nut and the end there but it's you know it's a better match than that is and that somebody else did that so now that I've got this piece here why don't we just get rid of this and put a piece in here that'll match better Now we just got to give the binding a little more time to dry. This little hole that I, uh, when, you know, and I shortened this up, it left the hole that I filled. And so I'm just going to put some brown dye on that now. And I'm spreading the dye out just a little bit so it doesn't look like I just filled a hole. It looks, you know, maybe we can blend it out to the rest of it here. It really does look pretty good. You can barely even see it now looks real good yeah you can I mean if you look really close you'll see it but you have to be looking for it to see it now just going through and trying to get rid of any trace of this uh, wedge that I put in here 
you know, it, I had to take, went ahead and scraped the rest of the finish off because it was missing in so many places already anyway that it just looked bad. Yeah, that's, that's yellowing the binding just about perfectly. Um, that's working really good. On this F12, F5, we've got a um, request to change the end pin. It had just a um, metal, it had a metal deal there on the end, which was kind of awkward. And he, he requested that it be some kind of an end pin with, an Apple, or with a, a mother of pearl inlay. I keep these in stock. They're ebony. Very nice. And I'm going to drill this out and uh, put that in. I'm going to just kind of eyeball straightness here and just kind of look down the neck. I'm just looking down the top and the neck and trying to drill straight down that point there. And apparently the drill bit's not sharp enough, so we're going to sharpen the drill bit. I sharpened it by hand. I think that's going to make a huge difference here. Yep, made a huge difference. It went right through like butter. And you can see that the hole is too small for this to enter at the moment. Got my tapering tool here and just going to lightly taper it just very lightly just to see how it's lining up and to see how it's lining up specifically with this because I can always force the taper tool one way or the other it looks like I'm going to need to force it up a little bit it's not bad it's pretty close actually but I would say I need to take a little bit off the top more than the other places so I'm going to turn it over and kind of work on the downside of this. And then I just go ahead and let it go on in. And we might be there. I think we might be there already. Because we got the thickness of that plate there too. And it looks pretty darn good. I think I'm going to stop right there. And figure it out after I get it put back together. In fact, I think to save myself some headache, I'm going to ream this hole just a little bit because I just know it's going to catch. You know, it, you can never get that kind of thing lined up perfectly. So this hole usually needs to be a hair bigger than the hole that's in the, the uh, wood or you're just going to have trouble. I've got the pin almost going in tight like that. It's about a sixteenth of an inch from going in and when I get them that close and it's you know I think it's just fine I'm just going to tap it in the rest of the way. Perfect. You would be very hard pressed to pull that out. Now it's not that it won't come out but it it would take quite a bit of work to get that out of there. That's a good thing and a bad thing. Hopefully you don't have to take it apart anymore but if you do I've learned that if you take you know these screws out and you just take some wooden wedges and go in underneath the metal here just from both sides and just wiggle it a little bit and just you know it'll push this right out. I'm going to put a set of A270's. He wanted it set up for medium strings. These are GHS A270's which in my opinion are identical in every way shape form size to the J74's by Diodario. So they're, I can't tell a bit of difference in them. I put them both on interchangeably. I cannot tell any difference. So that's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. They're the, basically the same thing. They're even made out of the same materials. Uh, so, you know, when all things are equal to me, I don't hear the difference. Some people claim they can, but I think some people make lots of rash claims. Now we're going to work on the nut here and uh, set this baby up and call her finished. I did a lot of other, he had a long list of items, little things, and I did almost all of those off camera. They were just little things like buff out this, polish that, fix that little nick, you know, little things like that. And So I did almost all of those off camera. 
and I think we were pretty successful. About the only thing I didn't do much with was this peg head. I just oiled it with some linseed oil. I buffed out this area here. It looked like there was some glue that maybe this had broke off at one time and they glued it back and it was a little sloppy on their glue work and you can still see it's a little messed up but I did buff that out as much as I could. I'm afraid this finish that's on this peg head is uh, brittle and will chip off so I just didn't want to mess with the peg head too much. Other than that I pretty much did everything on his list. I'm not going to show cutting the nut and all that on this video because I've got it in so many other videos. We've got this hybrid F12, F5 mandolin all put together and up in real good shape, I believe. Probably the best shape it's been in in a long, 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 long time because it couldn't have been in very good shape as low as that fretboard was. It was just crazy, crazy low. It holds a pick at the seventh fret, yet the uh, bridge is not sitting down on the bottom like it was. It's way up there in the air where it ought to be. I'm so glad he let me put that wedge under there. You know, we could have gone a long, long way around and reset the whole neck, but that's a very hard job and a lot of hours. So I think that was the right decision. You can't, I mean, you can tell it if you look at it there. You can see it, but doggone it, it's not that bad. And uh, let's put it through its paces and see what it sounds like. a lot of playing in. I hope you enjoyed it. Look at the F12 to F5 conversion mandolin and uh, it's a really nice mandolin that's gonna make him happy for years to come I believe. Thanks for watching.